Basically, every economically developed country in the world has done the math, and the math says to build out a high-speed rail network. It's not at all clear to me that the U.S. government has done the math, so today I'm going to do it for them. I'm going to walk through how I evaluate the most important places to build high-speed rail, and then we're going to go through a list of all the city pairs in North America where it makes sense to build a connection, and it's all coming up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation, viewer-suggested topics always welcome. But this one's really an update of the very first video I ever made, where I counted down the 10 city pairs in the US that made the most sense for high-speed rail. Suffice to say, it's a topic that I thought was so important and so poorly understood that it was really the impetus for me to even start this channel. Now, I feel the discourse around high-speed rail has actually come a long way in the last couple of years, but I really wanted to completely overhaul my approach to the topic. So today, I'm including all of North America. I'm using the latest and greatest population data Data, and I've done some more analysis to really refine my methodology. Let's talk about North America a bit. You'll occasionally hear people talk about quote-unquote North America as if it only includes like the US and Canada, which to me is, I don't know, kind of unsavory. The southern border of the US is at least as important, probably more so from a demand perspective. And I just increasingly think there's no way to talk about this topic without thinking through cross-border connections. Okay, let's talk methodology because I've done a lot more thinking about how to do this. First of all, what's at the core of this is what we call a gravity model, which estimates the overall travel attraction between two geographies, or you could say, their gravitational influence on each other. The most basic way to do this, which is the way I've done it in the past, is to take the product of the city's two populations and divide it by the square of the distance between them. But I think there's a better way to do this because the distance is supposed to be the relative friction or impedance between the cities. But really, it isn't the distance that's the most important thing, it's really the time. So instead of using distance squared in the denominator, I'm now using time squared, and I'll get into how I calculate that in a minute. The other important piece here is this triangle, which shows the travel time competitiveness of high-speed rail compared to air travel and highway travel. And we can use it to judge the likelihood that someone will choose rail over a competing mode. But today I'm going to reconstruct that triangle and refine it using real data from all three modes. I'm going to do this in two steps. First, just the pure travel time between departure and arrival, which is going to vary by city pair. And then the fixed time costs, meaning access and egress from an air airport or a train station, security, boarding and disembarking, all the super fun parts of intercity travel that aren't really going to vary with the distance of the trip. So what I did here was, for air travel, I grabbed the median scheduled non-stop flight duration for 25 North American city pairs that fall within the likely high-speed rail sweet spot of, say, 50 to 800 miles. And what you get is a scatter plot that fits to a linear equation pretty well, and that equation has a y-intercept of about 55, meaning your flight is going to take a minimum of 55 minutes, no matter how short it is. Remember, departure and arrival are when the plane pulls back from the gate at one end and pulls in on the other, and there's a lot of taxiing, waiting, and out-of-direction takeoff and landing patterns that happen regardless of how long the flight is. For the variable piece, there's a slope coefficient of 0.11, meaning each mile is going to add like 6.5 seconds to the flight duration. For driving, I grabbed Google's estimated median travel time, assuming a midday departure, between 12 city pairs that are strong candidates for high-speed rail. Again, very linear, the slope is basically 1, which means you average about 60 miles an hour once you get out on the open road. But there's a 30-minute y-intercept, which essentially represents the additional delay you experience in getting into and out of the two cities. And for high-speed rail, there's no North American data I can use to analyze this, which is pretty outrageous. So I grabbed timetable information for three high volume city pairs each from Spain, France, Japan, and China. Again, pretty linear. There's a fixed time cost of 25 minutes for acceleration and deceleration and slow zones within the cities at each end. And then a coefficient of 0.36, meaning each mile traveled adds like 21 to 22 seconds, which translates to around 165 miles an hour. 
The trains really top out faster than that, but most of the lines I looked at include additional stops en route, which I think many of the city pairs we talk about today will include as well. And going back to the gravity model, this is the equation I used to translate distance to time in the denominator. Okay, so we've established basic time distance plots for our three travel modes. So let's move on to step two, which is applying additional time penalties. This is where driving shines. No additional time penalty, you just get in and go. For air travel, the additional time penalty can be really variable, but I just wanna work with one set of assumptions, and that's gonna be 45 minutes travel time to and from the airports on each end. You're gonna to get to the airport 90 minutes early like a conscientious traveler, and I'm saying 20 minutes at the arrival end to disembark and make your way to ground transportation. So all told, that's an additional 200 minute fixed cost for air travel. Now, maybe you can get to the airport faster and maybe you have global entry or pre-check, but I'm trying to do a conservative estimate for a typical person traveling between large, busy cities. For high-speed rail travel, I'm gonna use a pretty aggressive assumption, which is 10 minutes access time to the station on each end and 20 minutes total boarding and alighting. This isn't meant to be realistic for the median traveler. This is so I can capture the whole universe of people who might potentially take the train because that sets the table for the next step, which accounts for the probability of taking the train. So I'm using one triangle here, but just to be clear, every individual person and situation is going to have its own version of this triangle that depends on how close or far they or their destination are from the airport and train station, how far in advance they like to get to the airport, etc. The triangle is just a generalized case to help us analyze and compare city pairs. You'll see the travel time advantage of high-speed rail kicks in at 50 miles, which is really the shortest distance it makes any sense for any traveler. It peaks at 250 miles, where driving and flying are essentially equivalent, and high-speed rail is the best option for nearly everyone. And the advantage over air travel slowly dissipates until you get to about 750 miles. So what I do here is take the gravity score for each city City pair. I give 100% credit at 250 miles, and the amount of credit scales to zero as you approach the other two vertices of the triangle. One more note, last time I kind of used the Paris to Lyon city pair as a threshold for what I wanted to include on the list. This time, I'm using Madrid to Valencia for no reason in particular other than I rode it like three times last year and it was packed all three times. And it runs like 25 to 30 times a day and that number seems to be going up with the addition of new carriers. Madrid to Valencia is a weaker pair than Paris to Lyon, so this is going to result in a lot more viable city pairs this time. 56 to be exact. And I think what's at the top of this list should be fairly obvious, so instead of counting down to number one, I'm gonna count up to number 56, so let's just get into it. First on the list, shocker, New York to DC. Some additional notes on methodology as I go through. I used census combined statistical areas for population, so for example, DC includes Baltimore, which I think is fine for high-speed rail analysis. You're gonna have stations in both cities, just as Acela does today. Similarly, number two, New York to Boston. The Boston CSA includes Providence, and you're definitely gonna get a stop there. So already, after two city pairs, we've got the core of the Northeast core or covered. Let's add number three, New York to Philly, just for good measure. As I add lines to the map, I'm gonna make the thickness proportional to the score my model spits out, but try not to think about this as ridership because that also depends on things like train frequency and ticket price. Number four, LA to the Bay Area, and keep in mind, the LA CSA includes the Inland Empire, and the Bay Area includes both San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose. I've done videos on some of these city pairs, and those are linked down in the description. Okay, five is Mexico City to Guadalajara. I had to apply some unprofessional judgment to figure out what Mexican and Canadian combined statistical areas would look like, and for CDMX, I did add Toluca and Cuernavaca, so it ends up being bigger than New York, by about 3 million, but it just doesn't have the constellation of large metro areas in close proximity the way New York does, so none of the Mexican pairs is quite as strong as what you have in the northeastern U.S. Next is Los Angeles to San Diego. So another executive decision I made was to combine cross-border metro areas into the same CSA, so this is San Diego slash Tijuana, and I'm not applying any kind of penalty for the border crossing because this list exists in a better world 
world where we can travel more freely to our neighboring countries. It's my list. If you want to mentally penalize these cities and downgrade them, that's on your conscience. Pro tip, by the way, if you want to fly from San Diego to cities in Mexico, you can walk across the border to the Tijuana airport, which I have flown out of and it's pretty nice. Okay, that gets us started on three major corridors, but as we get into the meat of this list, it gets very interesting the way the network builds out. But first, a brief reminder to do all the usual stuff that helps spread my channel to more hapless victims. Connect on the apps and consider supporting directly on Patreon. I am taking next Wednesday off because I've got speaking engagements in Tampa Bay and San Luis Obispo, but I'll try to sneak in a live stream as replacement content, like next Wednesday or Thursday. Hit the notification bell and or keep tabs on Instagram if you wanna know more about any of that stuff. Okay, let's go to city pair number seven, which is Dallas-Fort Worth to Houston. And I've got a whole video about this one where I learned a lot about Bucky's in the comments. Go check it out. Number eight, DC to Philly. Remember, this is just city pairs and there's a whole different level of analysis you'd wanna to do to evaluate the strength of corridors with overlapping pairs where there's a cumulative effect. I've actually done this for the East Coast and for a potential Chicago hub system, so go check those out. Let's go to a new area of the map for numbers nine and 10, Toronto, Detroit, and Chicago, Detroit. I included Windsor, Ontario as part of the Detroit CSA, and I had to manually add metros like Hamilton, Kitchener, Guelph, and Oshawa to approximate a Toronto CSA, which gets it close to the size of Chicago. But more importantly, Toronto is closer to optimal distance for this analysis. 11, Mexico City to Lyon. 12, New York to Toronto, and 13, New York to Montreal. So we're already starting to get the East Coast and the Great Lakes hooked up. 14 is Boston to Philly. And then let's start expanding the LA hub system. 15 is the connection to Phoenix, and 16 is the connection to Vegas, which sadly may be closer to reality than anything on this list. 17, New York to Hartford slash New Haven, which is defined as its own CSA. And for 18 and 19, we'll expand the Mexico City network with connections to Puebla and San Luis Potosi. Let's jump around a bit now. New York to Pittsburgh, which I'm gonna route through Philly for reasons. 21, Mexico City to Carretero, which I talk about in this extremely underviewed video. 22, Miami to Orlando, which I haven't talked about much, but does now exist in a fashion. Washington to Pittsburgh, which I don't know if this gets routed through Philly, but it's a lot of tunneling. And Washington to Boston. 25 is another international connection, Boston to Montreal, which I'm gonna route economically here. 26, New York to Harrisburg, which I had no idea was a CSA of 1.3 million until a couple days ago. 27, Chicago to Indianapolis to build out that Midwest hub. And then let's continue to expand the LA hub with Fresno at 28 and Sacramento at 29. For number 30, let's go to a part of the map we haven't touched yet. Atlanta to Charlotte, which did get selected as part of the FRA's Corridor Identification and Development Program and is gonna get some funding for an engineering feasibility study. Alan Fisher put out a really good video last week on the goings on at the federal level. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. 31, New York to Cleveland. So you can see how that New York gravity really starts pulling in the Great Lakes cities. 32, Chicago to St. Louis. You know, last year the FRA authorized speeds up to 110 miles an hour on this corridor, and that is not at all high speed rail, but for the US, eh, maybe it is. 33, Toronto to Montreal. Kind of expected it to grade out higher on this list, but at that distance, a lot of air trips are still gonna be pretty competitive. And 34, New York to Albany. 35, Mexico City to Aguas Calientes. I don't know exactly how you do this network. Nothing I'm doing here is to be construed as an engineering level alignment study. 36, Chicago to Cleveland. So now we've completed a connection from the East Coast to the Midwest. 37, Washington to Raleigh-Durham, which gets us ever closer to connecting our big East Coast corridor. 38, Mexico City to Monterey, the longest connection on this list. 39, DC to Toronto, piggybacks onto connections we've already made. And the next three really build out our Texas Triangle Network. I've got Dallas to San Antonio at number 40, Houston to San Antonio at 41, and Dallas to Austin at 42. Number 43, let's extend our Florida corridor with Miami to Tampa, St. Pete. And 44, let's add another piece to the Great Lakes network with Detroit to Cleveland. 45 
45, Los Angeles to Mexicali, which I'll route through San Diego. 46 and 47, piggyback onto existing connections. Philly to Hartford, New Haven, and New York to Richmond. 48, Chicago to Cincinnati, which I'll route through Indianapolis. And 49, DC to Hampton Roads, which I'll route through Richmond. Okay, we're down to it, <laughs> the last seven. These next two already exist in our network, Chicago to Toronto and New York to Rochester. We're gonna add Nashville to our emerging Atlanta hub, Minneapolis St. Paul to the Chicago hub, and we're gonna add the Houston to Austin connection to the Texas network. Number 55, DC to Charlotte, which is a relief. I mean, I was just gonna die if we didn't get all of that connected up. And 56, a bit anticlimactic, it's DC to Hartford, New Haven. Okay, that was a lot, but remember, these are all city pairs that, in terms of population and distance, have stronger potential than Madrid to Valencia, and that route is currently served by like 25 to 30 trains a day. Areas that are conspicuously omitted in this network, the Mountain West, so Denver and Salt Lake, just too remote, and anything connecting to Seattle, which is the biggest city in North America that just doesn't show up here. And look, I'm a Pacific Northwesterner. I'm as disappointed as anyone that a Portland-Seattle-Vancouver corridor did not make the cut, but it just doesn't have the gravitational weight. It's not that far off, but remember, I'm trying to look at national priorities. If the fine people of the Breakaway Republic of Cascadia decide they want to fund high-speed rail with their own hard-earned cash. I'm good with it. And I understand that there's this extremely human, extremely visceral urge to try to connect the dots of what you perceive as gaps on the network. Just resist. Indianapolis to Nashville isn't a very strong pair. Chicago to Nashville is just too far. And Louisville just doesn't help that much. Atlanta to Orlando, you could make a tourism case for if you can get Delta to do code sharing and figure out security. Monterey to Houston or San Antonio just doesn't quite get there. Although, you know, the first line they built in Spain, the one that they apparently prioritized, was Madrid to Sevilla, which is a significantly weaker pair than Madrid to Valencia or Barcelona. So if that was my threshold criterion, we'd be adding another 60 or 70 city pairs to this map, including basically everything I just mentioned. I keep things pretty light on this channel, but I don't think it's an overstatement to say that it's an absolute scandal that we don't don't have a single one of these lines. Parts of New York to DC and Miami to Orlando are approaching the definition of true high-speed rail, but they just aren't what they should be. I'm afraid the lesson here might be building climate-friendly transportation infrastructure that generates massive society-wide benefits is something, I don't know, totalitarianism is very good at and democracy is very bad at. But Eh, Spain keeps growing its Ave network, which expanded into Asturias this year. Spain is a constitutional monarchy, which is probably more democracy than we're going to have by this time next year if the election goes sideways. At least the administration we have now is finally putting some money into this stuff. Oops, I made it political. But it's an election year, what'd you expect? Thanks for joining, and thanks as always to the patrons for supporting the channel directly. It really does make a huge difference in the freedom I have to tackle topics I want to tackle. Keep the great topic suggestions coming. I'll be back with a new episode in two weeks with maybe a live stream in between. But either way, I'll see you then.